Hi everyone and a really warm welcome to Ask the Experts, Our Steps Towards Earlier Diagnosis. We're so pleased to see so many of you here today. Uh, I'm Helen Dickens, Director of Programmes at Target Ovarian Cancer and I'm thrilled to welcome Dr Charlotte Badescu and Catherine Pearson, our experts for today's session. I'd also like to start with a big thank you to Helen whose story we'll be sharing as part of the event. So just a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Over the last few weeks, we've all been taking action as part of Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. We've been raising awareness, campaigning and supporting each other. Um, and as we draw the month to an end, I'm really delighted to be chairing today's event um, to provide an update on some of the steps that we've been taking behind the scenes to find new ways to improve ovarian cancer diagnosis. And this is really a key priority for us at Target Ovarian Cancer, as we know how important getting a diagnosis as soon as possible is for everyone affected by ovarian cancer. And we're committed to taking every action we can alongside you. Um, and we have great agenda lined up for today. Uh, so first, we'll be sharing a recording from Helen, a woman living with ovarian cancer, about her experiences. And then we'll hand over to, Sh to Dr. Charlotte Badescu, who will share her experience as a GP and as someone who has received a diagnosis herself and her passion for helping other women in the future. Going on from Charlotte, Catherine Pearson, our clinical change manager, will provide an update on a really exciting project that we've been doing to improve the diagnosis of ovarian cancer in partnership with local primary care teams. And then you'll have the opportunity to put your questions to Charlotte and Catherine about their presentations in our Q&A. Now, as the focus of today's event is on diagnosis, uh, we won't be able to answer questions today on things like treatment or clinical trials, but you can find recordings of our previous Ask the Experts events that talk about these topics in the ovarian cancer community. And as always, our nurse advisors are available to speak on our support line if you have any questions that you would like to discuss further. Please remember that everyone attending the webinar today uh, may be at a different stage and coping differently. Um, so just keep this in mind and respect everyone's views and concerns. We want to ensure that this session is a safe and positive space for everyone joining us today uh, or watching back at a later date. Um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier as well, we can't provide answers to very specific individual situations today. Um, and anything that we do raise today wouldn't be medical advice or a substitute for information you might receive from your own medical team. But if anything comes up today that you're not sure about, you know, what it might mean for you or your loved one, or if it brings up any difficult feelings, um, you can of course call our support line and speak to one of our nurse advisors. Uh, we'll add the support line number to the comments so that you have access to that now. Um, that was it from me. I'm really looking forward to the session today. So without uh, any further ado, uh, we'll kick off the event with a video from Helen, who's very kindly shared her story with us. It's like a roller coaster. One day I can re be really good and almost run a marathon and the next day I can't. Very well, thank you. Very well. I'm comfortable. My name is Helen Hills. I'm 65 years old and I live in Alfreton, Derbyshire. Before I was diagnosed, I would not have gone to the GP um, with bloating because I looked at my age and just thought it's probably my age, actually. And I hadn't been doing quite as much exercise as I had previously. And I just thought it's a combination of age. No need to worry. Then it was devastation. And then I remember talking about my family, in particular my son who has a heart condition, because I've always been there for him and still wanted to be there for him because he's got further treatment. My diagnosis had quite an impact on my mental health and well-being. I've always been a fairly positive person. Um, I don't know whether my husband would say that, but I have. And so to be given that diagnosis, it was almost like I wore a badge on my head. You have cancer. Now, the only person that could see that badge, which didn't exist, was myself. But that's how I felt. I've always made Christmas cakes for my boys. And I had to tell them I couldn't do it. And that was simply because I couldn't stand there long enough stirring. It wasn't that I didn't want to do it. And that was quite a hard thing for me to say. 
you know, mum can't make your Christmas cake. As it was, they all came back and said, oh, we're going to Marks and Spencer's and buy them. So it, did, it didn't, it didn't matter. It mattered more to me. My understanding also is that only one in five women can actually point bloating as one of the symptoms of ovarian cancer. Women know when they're not feeling well. They know there's something wrong. We just have gut feelings. And it's at that point we need to see our GPs and push for further tests if necessary. I think if you're diagnosed with ovarian cancer, the chances are you do have a fear or anxiety. And that tends to be around what's going to happen in the future. Also, if you suddenly begin to feel a little bit unwell, um, if your stomach gets upset or something, or you've got a little bit of bloatedness, you tend to think, oh no, it's coming back again. It's, and I think that again is where the online community helps because you can put it on there and somebody will come back and say, oh, I had that, but it was just wind. You know, so it backs up what, you're, what you know logically, <laughs> but you're not always thinking logically. I think family members assume that once you've done one treatment or you've had your operation, you know, the, like the treatment I've had, my operation, my chemo, then my Avastin and everything I had, I think that they're assuming that things will get back to normal, that mum will get back to normal. What, what they're not thinking of, or certainly one of them isn't thinking of, is that it might, it will come again, and we might have to do all this again. I know that, but I'm not sure that they want to hear that, or even understand that. And that, is something we'll have to tackle when we get there. It's something we'll just discuss when it happens. In the meantime, we go with Mama She Is. like to say a huge thank you to Helen for sharing her story with us today and I, I think you'll share with me that it's such a powerful reminder of why raising awareness and working to improve early diagnosis is, is just so important um, and that's why we're here today. Uh, so we know that GPs play a crucial role in helping to spot the potential symptoms of ovarian cancer so I'm delighted now to hand over to, shop, to Dr Charlotte Badescu who is an incredible advocate for change. So Charlotte, over to you. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you to Maya and Soraya and all the guys today at Target Ovarian Cancer. Thank you for having me here uh, to speak to you. Um, sorry if I sound a little bit stuffed up or a bit breathless, I'm just recovering from a chest infection. So I sound a little bit of under the weather, but I'm absolutely fine. Um, so as Helen mentioned, um, I am a GP, um, Maya, if you could just go to the next slide. I am a practicing GP in Manchester, that's where I'm based. Um, and I do have my own personal experience with ovarian cancer um, when I was diagnosed in 2021. And um, since my diagnosis, I really made it one of my aims to start fundraising for Target um, and try to support all the amazing work that they do. And recently, I was really delighted to be invited to join uh, Target's Primary Care Advisory Board. And I'll speak a little bit more about the really exciting and, and important work that we're doing on the board uh, later on in my presentation. Next slide, please. So a little bit about my own personal story. Um, so I was 31 back in 2021. I just got married um, and obviously, doctor working in the NHS on the front line during the pandemic, my husband also working in the hospital um, on the front line. Everything was very stressful at that point. I had been having some symptoms of fatigue and tiredness, 
some kind of mild changes to my bowels and I was just putting it to one side in my mind I wasn't thinking about it you know being something serious I thought it was stress thought it might be a bit of irritable bowel syndrome affecting me and um, you know I had a lot going on planning a wedding as well it was so much um, and it was when we started trying for a baby shortly after that and I stopped my contraceptive pill um, that I didn't get any periods um, and I wasn't getting pregnant and so I actually went to my own GP um, to talk about that. That was what brought me to my GP. And she went through all my symptoms and she, she talked to me about everything and about the other symptoms that I've been having. And she said, you know, I think we need to do some further tests. So um, she sent me for some hormone tests because we initially thought maybe it was a fertility problem and my hormones were, were very abnormal. And from that, she decided to do SCA125 and an ultrasound scan of my pelvis. And, and, and that's what really clinched the diagnosis. And I received the diagnosis the following day that I had a, a large tumor filling my whole pelvis and it looked cancerous. It looked like it was coming from my ovary. And so of course, then I was quickly into oncology and, and, and planning for my treatment. Um, but as I've mentioned, my symptoms were very vague and I was very fortunate to have that GP who really dug into those symptoms and really thought outside of the box about what could be causing them. And the, the first picture on the left really shows that um, I didn't have the typical symptom of, of bloating, which can be one of the symptoms. And I just want to point out that, that not all women do. Um, and that was the picture taken the night before my, my surgery. So my, my tummy really wasn't bloated at all. Um, and the picture on the right at the top is with my husband. Um, so as part of the treatment that I had, um, they gave me injections to stimulate the, the ovary that wasn't affected to try and take out my eggs so that they could be frozen for future from a chance of having a biological child in the future. Um, so, so this is the treatment that I was having. And I was really inspired by my own GP um, who, who helped to make that diagnosis and um, to take that forward and, and try to help others and receive their diagnoses earlier and, and try to spread the word to other GPs. Next slide, please. So a little bit about ovarian cancer. We learn in medical school as doctors that it, it, it's quite a rare cancer, but, but really it's not, you know, seven and a half thousand new cases in the UK every year. And then average GP surgery has around 10,000 patients. So at any one time, there may be three or four women that have got a diagnosis who are, who are being cared for at that time. Um, affects in the general population around one in 50 women. But we can see that if you've got a first degree relative that's affected, so that's it's your mother, your sister or your daughter, it goes up to one in 20. So we can really see how, how big a part the genetics play in this disease. And of course, we know that the sooner we, we make that diagnosis, and the, the better it is because the greater the chance that, that we can receive that treatment. Next slide, please. So this is a schematic of the ovary. So it's just showing about there's lots of different types of ovarian cancer, and, and they kind of mapped up to the different types of cells that are found in the ovary. Now, the type that's the most common, which accounts for over 90% of ovarian cancers, is on the right side column, the top one, serous type. And there are two subtypes within that high grade and low grade serous. So the large majority of the time when we're talking about ovarian cancer symptoms, and um, tests and treatment, clinical trials, they're mostly based around the, that type of ovarian cancer. But just to show that there are other types and they can present in slightly different ways and they have different tests and sometimes they have different treatments as well. Next slide, please. So I, I started to think about really the challenges that I face as a clinician, as a GP, and also that I've been on the other side of now that I've experienced as a patient in getting that diagnosis of ovarian cancer. And I think the first thing to, to think about really is awareness amongst patients, so amongst women, how do they know to come to their GP initially? We need to spread the word, as Helen was saying in the video, about what the symptoms are so that women know to come and make an appointment. Otherwise, they're not gonna know to come in in the first place if, if they don't know. And there are so many opportunities where we're seeing women and um, for other reasons, you know, it may be we're seeing a woman for her cervical smear or we're seeing her for a check about contraception or maybe even about menopause symptoms. And, and those are opportunities where we might be able to actually inform women about ovarian cancer symptoms and to ask them 
about their family history or about any symptoms they might be having. And, and this is part of the work that we're doing at the moment with the Primary Care Advisory Board, where we can see where we can use these opportunities to make changes. Not enough appointments. We all know that this has really been an issue, especially since the pandemic. Getting in to make an appointment, see your GP, even over the phone, I, I know has been really, really challenging to do. So this is an ongoing problem. Knowledge gap for clinicians. So as a GP, you can't know everything about everything. It, it's so hard. There are so many different conditions to know about, but it's, it's kind of knowing what you don't know and knowing to learn more about and improve your knowledge and about you know, gaps in your knowledge there. And that's what we're trying to work on at Target as well. So we have these amazing GP education programs and we've reached so many GPs. I think since 2009, 21,000 GPs so far that we've reached um, through face-to-face -face and virtual education programs at conferences, online resources, paper resources. So we're really trying to change that knowledge gap as much as we can. And GPs are obviously dealing with lots of different problems at once. So it's very rare that a patient might present with just a single symptom and we're thinking immediately of ovarian cancer. Usually there, there are lots of different things that might be going on and we might be treating women for different conditions or considering tests for other symptoms they might have. And the issue is sometimes things can get a bit muddy and it can get a bit confused and we don't follow up necessarily or marry up previous consultations with the current consultation. And that really needs to change so that we can be identifying that this woman has a pattern of having presented with certain symptoms and we can look at what she's had in the past and, and see if we need to do further tests. And we're working on clinical systems within the primary care advisory board that will allow us to do that and use tech to do that as well. Waiting lists have been a real problem. You know, accessing those scans, getting them on time, getting the results on time, um, referring, being able to get a hospital appointment once you've once your GP's made that referral, it, it's been really difficult. And, and obviously these delays all add up at the end of the day. And, and the sooner we can get that diagnosis, we know the better. And then interpretation of those results. So once you've had that blood test done, once you've had that scan done, you know, your GP knowing how to interpret that, what if the result is borderline? What if there's, you know, a change there, but it's not necessarily cancer, but it might be something concerning. Do we need to repeat the test? So giving that information to GPs and supporting them, and obviously the nurse advice line, like we've already said, is there for any queries that you might have and um, to, to offer advice um, about those more difficult situations as well, where it's a bit in between. Next slide, please. So many of you will have heard of the Pathfinder, and this is a report that's produced by Target. It's done every couple of years, so it came out last year. Um, and it's a state, state of the nation report um, looking at basically what's going on at the moment in the world of ovarian cancer and what do we need to change to make things better for women. And we looked at four different domains within this. So I've already mentioned about raising awareness um, so that both women, their relatives and loved ones and doctors and clinicians as well, they know to come and do those tests if needed so that we can make the diagnosis earlier. And, and getting those diagnostic tests is really important as well. And we're working on looking at what diagnostic tests are being developed in the future and um, screening tools potentially that might be developed in the future to make diagnostics better for women. Treatment wise, we know that's come on leaps and bounds in recent years. And um, we know with the advent of maintenance treatments and genomic testing as well and, and you know, clinical trials, things have really changed. But we do know that there's a huge regional variation in particularly in access to clinical trials across the country. And I know that's something that Catherine's going to be talking about today. And that's really something that we're trying to improve as well to make it an opportunity for every woman who wishes to access certain treatments or certain clinical trials should be able to if it's clinically appropriate. And support. Support is a huge one. And we know in general that gynecological cancer and ovarian cancer in particular is so under-resourced. And that clinical nurse specialist with the CNS resource is such an undervalued resource and we're really campaigning to change that and to put more funding into that so that women can receive that specialist support that they really do need when they receive this diagnosis. Next slide please. So I mentioned that I'm part of this primary care advisory board so we're a group of clinicians and most of us are patient facing so 
we're seeing patients, you know, in our everyday jobs, we've got direct experience of doing tests and making diagnoses for patients. And several of us also have personal experience as well, whether that be um, that we've had ovarian cancer ourselves or we've had a very close relative that has had ovarian cancer or been affected by ovarian cancer. So we really know how it feels and we've got a real vested interest to make a change and to improve things. And all the different things that we're doing that I've mentioned about, um, we're trying to just change those systems and make things better for the future so that everyone can have that chance to be able to be diagnosed at an earlier stage and so that they can have that treatment. And working with particular new people and partnerships is something that we're also looking into at the moment. So we're looking into educating other healthcare professionals as well, not just GPs, but we're looking into practice nurses as well, physicians, associates, training GPs. So the GPs of the future, they'll be already be able to know about ovarian cancer and make those diagnoses by the time that they are fully qualified GPs and that will make a real difference as well. Next slide, please. And the final slide. So I'll be really pleased to take any questions that you've got. And this is me and my husband at the top of Machu Picchu, which we did last year and raised around 10,000 pounds for ovarian cancer. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for taking us through that and, and ending on that wonderful picture of, of you both and, and top of that amazing challenge that, that you achieved and, and fundraised for us. So thank you. And um, I think, again, your presentation just kind of really flagged up some of the real challenges I think we all know um, we still have around the diagnosis of diagnosis of ovarian cancer and um, you know around awareness of symptoms getting people aware of those symptoms we all I think on this call do a huge amount of work around that awareness raising um, and thinking about how do we get that kind of knowledge to as many GPs as possible is really really important so that we can reduce those delays that, that you highlighted there and um, just before we go into questions because I know we've had lots coming through and, and we want to give time for that and um, I'd like to introduce Catherine now so Catherine Pearson is our clinical change manager at Target Ovarian Cancer and has been leading a project for us uh, looking at how can we provide some kind of practical tools um, and different ways that we can support GPs to kind of make that diagnosis uh, within their practice so Catherine, over to you. So uh, this, this presentation is about a project that was funded by a foundation called the Peter Salvi Foundation. It was um, quite a long time in preparing and organizing because it was the first time Target Ovarian Cancer has done a project of this sort, and it came in two parts. So the first part was looking at why is there geographical variation in the stage of cancer at diagnosis, because that is uh, ranges, as you know, uh, from nearly 22 to well into the 70s. It's a huge gap um, between those two rates. And so the hypothesis was that if that is a gap, then why doesn't everybody move up to being at the top and can't we improve things? And the first stage of the, re of the research looked at that and found that there were a number of reasons why that happened. Um, and a lot of those reasons were to do with who is uh, leading on data, in a region and whether they have a determination to find out about what's going on with patients with ovarian cancer or whether their concentration is more upon all gynecological cancers, um, whether GPs uh, have the capacity and the passion and the interest to lead on this particular cancer. And so we set out to find some ways to bring everybody to the same stage. So it's not just people who maybe have personal experience or somebody they love has had personal experience of ovarian cancer, but it's very simple for every clinician in primary we care to start thinking about ovarian cancer. And that work divided roughly into two areas, uh, something around education, something that Charlotte's already touched upon, um, and which the charity over a number of years has actually developed a very good track record and reputation for delivering uh, education to primary care. We did a very specific project uh, to look at the conversations that a GP might have with a gynecological surgeon when thinking about uh, ordering tests, the real detailed information they'd like to have. And we've produced 11 videos that we're looking to test in practice. I'm not going to talk about that today because we haven't completed the evaluation. The other main area that we looked at was can we use digital tools to prompt GPs to think of ovarian cancer and to access detailed information that's available to them, clinical guidance to help them do that. And we came up with three 
tools, which we tested in two parts of the UK of England. One part was Pennines, Lancashire, that sort of Cumbria area, and the other part was Devon and Cornwall. So these tools were developed in partnership with clinicians in those areas and with project managers and with data quality managers, a whole multidisciplinary group of brains coming together to work. How are we going to introduce these tools in a way that will be simple for a GP to use in practice? And uh, just to give you a bit of a spoiler alert, we were able to do that. And I think that's really the headline I'd like you to take away. It is possible to use digital tools to help all GPs and primary care clinicians to think ovarian cancer. These things don't mean much to us as labels, as patients. So I'm just going to show you what each of the tools were and then tell you something about how the pilot, um, how the clinicians doing the pilot experience them and what they want to do with them next. So a clinical alert is something that's actually quite common in primary care. All sorts of GP systems can generate these alerts. This particular one that we used used one particular system called Enis Web, and the IT was led by a woman who was incredibly ambitious about reducing late diagnosis of ovarian cancer for personal reasons. And so she put her whole heart and soul into this. And I think that's something that comes through a lot in this work. It's about a hearts and minds campaign. You know, people want to do it, they can do it. People bring the right teams together, motivate the right teams with the right ambition, it can happen. So top lesson here, digital tools are not about technology and programming. They're about wanting them to work and then they will work. So just to summarize this IT alert, the box shows you what it looks like. The GP is in a consultation with a patient and, um, the patient is over 50 and they're coding a new diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome or diverticulitis. And the data, this alert spots that there isn't a recent CA125 blood test result on the patient record. So this pops up and suggests to the GP, you might want to think about ovarian cancer. And if you do, you might want to order a CA125 and or an ultrasound image. And by the way, here is your guidance as to what should happen with patients in this situation. So this was tested very successfully in Pennine, Lancashire. 17 GP practices took part um, over a short period that went from sort of like mid-December to the end of March. So it included the Christmas break period. And in that time they did, uh, the pop-up came up um, a number of times but one of the times it came up, it was a woman who then went on to have a proper diagnosis of ovarian cancer. And that was earlier than um, it would have been. That was really important for that GP practice and that group of practices. They sort of felt confidence about this IT alert. And we were quite surprised when we did the evaluation workshop last summer to discover that everybody who'd been involved in piloting this um, thought that it was a good tool that it was very easy to upload and use, and that really is the credit to the data quality manager, and that they wanted to keep it. That is quite different to some of the work that Cancer Research UK has found around IT alerts, where they've discovered there's very low awareness. I think because this did find a woman and actually improve the situation for her, there is a greater commitment now um, to staying with this. These are some of the quotes that the clinicians gave us during that evaluation event. They felt it really was smart, that it really did help them consider ovarian cancer, um, and that it helped everybody in the practice to think about ovarian cancer more frequently. And we're really pleased to be able to report, this is a great piece of news for us at Target Ovarian Cancer. The woman who led this pilot um, has just been confirmed in post at the Cancer Alliance for um, primary care development and she's confirmed that they'll be taking forward this alert across the entire Cancer Alliance during this year. So a very powerful tool for her and she's a very good advocate for people in her area to carry on. Retrospective audit is literally what it says but it's still not a phrase that many of us will think of. It's a research to go back through patient records over, in this instance, the parameters were six months. This was led by physicians associates. So they're members of the primary care team who are clinically trained and they're able to run a search, which is a piece of just, you know, admin almost, but more importantly than that, they're able to run that search and then look at those notes and work out if it's appropriate to make a decision on whether this woman may or may not have been missed um, for ovarian cancer investigation. 
it takes a lot of time. There's a bit of kickback around this. Um, and at the moment, we think we might be able to take this forward in the Brighton area, where they're doing a big exploration around why some of their ovarian cancer diagnoses are late. So, th so in a way, this is also useful for a system to think about, are we missing women? How many women are we missing? And what might happen? What might we do next? We, um, in our pilot, this was again run by, as I said, the physician associates. They felt it was super. They really loved doing it. And the thing that it allowed them to do was they didn't, um, in the period through which we were running the pilot, they didn't identify a woman who then went on to have a diagnosis of cancer. But they were in their other work when they were taking blood tests, listening to patients and hearing the ovarian cancer symptoms. And they did, as a result, spot somebody because they were able to put a CA125 blood test on and that woman then turned out to have cancer. So it was the second woman that they identified, which really they felt was great success for the pilot. <clears throat> and it's that interesting phrase, isn't it? She was saying to us when we were doing the evaluation, I was very lucky because I was able to bring all my knowledge that I gained from the pilot uh, to, to bear on this. So it's that practical experience of learning as well as different types of education. And then a phrase that patients really don't know called safety netting, but safety netting has been around for a, quite a while and it's been used in a variety of situations, for example, children with fever to make sure that if it does turn out to be meningitis, they are diagnosed quickly. For us in ovarian cancer, safety netting means thinking about women who have presented with symptoms that we now recognise as being potentially ovarian cancer symptoms. And we've then asked for these women to have a CA125 blood test and it's come back normal. What do you do next to make sure that that woman is safe? And this, this um, tool, again, it's a data search looking at patient records. Um, in Pennines, Lancashire, the physicians associates were running it every month to see was there any woman who presented to their practice in that 28 day period who now might need a follow up to see if their CA125 needs to be repeated. And the question they asked by text, by phone, there's a number of mechanisms they can use, is how are your symptoms? If your symptoms persist, please come back and see us. Don't, don't just leave it, as Charlotte was saying, you know, make sure that you come back. Um, and again, the physicians associates found this was very, this is really important, I think, because of the workload in general practice. They described the workload as manageable and a positive experience for them to do. They felt it was a really good use of their clinical skill to be able to do this work to, to support women using the practice for their primary care. They felt that it gave them access to a really effective safety netting system and that learning they were going to take into all areas of their practice. Um, and they thought it was worthwhile, worthwhile for them as clinicians for their practice as a practice doing its best to support women and of course most importantly it was a good worthwhile exercise for their patients so they are now continuing to run this and we will get further data on it going through 2023 and an interesting um, response that they gave us during the evaluation was that when they contacted the patients and I think in those 12 week period it was something like um 24 patients they actually contacted. None of the patients knew what a CA125 test was. So it was sort of uh, useful for them as a starting point to say, these are the type of tests, this is what it will show you. So again, um, education for everybody, more power, more learning. That's where we got to with the pilots. We've issued a report this week, we issued it on Wednesday, that summarises that, gives us some headlines, um, and we've circulated it uh, throughout the country. We've had a nice response back from Wales, um, looking at it. We've already had some um, people saying they want to join the Early Diagnosis Network. Thank you, Charlotte, for being one of the leaders. Really pleased to see you there. Um, so that work is all now in the public domain. Um, we'll be taking it forward, looking for new primary care groups, uh, whether it's networks or individual practices or whole cancer alliances, to take forward some of these tools, test them further, help us build the evidence, help us find out more over a longer period what it says for early diagnosis. We've got the tools written up as how-to guides. We've got bits of IT protocols that we can share with people. So we're feeling quite optimistic that we will have a chance to expand this and get more learning. We also are obviously going to complete the evaluation of the videos, bringing together primary and secondary care to talk about the diagnostic pathway. And, um, we feel that the net is going to be a very powerful addition 
to what our offer is to clinicians alongside our already existing GP education work and GP network. So something optimistic maybe <laughs> coming forward for 2023. Thank you very much. I really look forward to your questions. Thank you, Catherine, for taking us through, uh, through the work that you and the team have been doing on really what's been quite a groundbreaking project, I think, kind of taking some of those what sound like quite simple tools, but really embedding them into that, that local practice. Um, and as you say, very encouraging to see some of those early results and, and some opportunities for us to work in other areas now to, to take that work forward. Um, we've got some time now for your questions. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Catherine and Charlotte to, to, to kind of answer some of the questions that we've had coming through. And I've seen lots popping up in the chat. So thank you so much for that. Um, and also for all of your pre-submitted questions that, that we've got to, to take to the panel today. Um, just wants to reiterate again at the start that there will be some questions we won't be able to cover today um, because uh, Charlotte's background, obviously, as a GP, uh, knows lots of expertise in that area around that kind of primary care and diagnosis piece. But um, questions we've got around kind of treatment, uh, recurrence and other aspects of care, we won't be able to cover today. Um, but as I said earlier, if there is anything that you'd like to have more information um, or advice on, um, you can, of course, call our support line at any time. So please do, do talk to our, our nurse advisors when you need to. So I'm going to start with a question for, um, for Charlotte, actually, if that's OK. Um, just uh, coming through about your experience that, that you, you very kindly shared with us um, and a question around when you went to your GP with those concerns that you had, did you feel that they you know, took you seriously straight away? Um, and do you think that your medical experience maybe helped with that conversation? Um, I think I'm very fortunate with my GP and I know everyone's had a wide range of experiences. I've seen a couple of positive experiences that people have given in the chat, which is great to hear. Um, so I, I do feel that she took me seriously um, from the start and, and in actual fact I feel it was the other way around she she kind of suspected things when I really wasn't in a way which really shows how I had the blinkers on and how sometimes we can be very unaware of what's going on and trying to just say to ourselves it's fine it's fine you know I'll be okay it's it's not anything serious I was thinking I'm young I'm just stressed so I, I feel my experience was was very positive from my GP point of view whether me being a GP myself um, affected that, obviously it's hard to know because I've never been a patient without being a GP myself. Um, but I know that that particular GP has had wonderful feedback from, from other patients as well who aren't medical professionals. Brilliant, thank you. And would you, what would you say to women who perhaps are um, wanting to make an appointment with their GP, they are concerned about symptoms, they're not quite sure what to say, what messages would you suggest that they take in to that consultation? I think write things down, that's really helpful, go in with a note or, or something on your phone and take someone with you if you can and you know and speak to them about what you want to speak about beforehand so that if you forget while you're in the consultation they can you know help pick up on that as well um, and then you know, if you are specifically worried about symptoms of ovarian cancer and you've read about them, say, I'm worried this could be ovarian cancer, because that in itself puts that kind of idea into the GP's mind from the start. So they're immediately thinking, OK, right, do we need to be doing some tests here to, to try and rule that out, to try and reassure that woman? There are lots of things running through our minds as clinicians when we're in a consultation and our minds are all over the place when we're, when we're hearing about symptoms from women and we're not always just down a flow chart of could it be this one condition so actually bringing that to the table and saying you know what I am I'm really panicked about this and um, you know if you've got a family history as well bring that to the table and and find out exactly what your family history is as well so write down who's been affected which relative it was what age they were diagnosed and if you know the type of cancer that they had Write that down as well so you can give it to your GP because that will really help as well. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, and of course, lots of information on our, our website if, if people are looking for support and information they can take along to their GP as well. Um, I want to move on now and talk a little bit about the CA125 blood test because I think there's been quite a lot of questions come through both before today and, and I can see on, on, on the session today around that blood test. So. I wonder, Charlotte, if you could just fill us in on what are the guidelines for 
obtaining a CA125 blood test, when would you expect that to happen? Sure, okay. So the national guidelines are that if a woman presents with um, one or more of the four main symptoms of ovarian cancer, so that's bloating and a feeling of early fullness or reduced appetite when you're eating, abdominal or pelvic pain, so pain in the tummy area, um, or changing in urinary symptoms, so you're feeling like you're peeing more often or more frequently, and these kind of symptoms are persistent or frequent over a sustained period of time. So they're not just something you've had for a couple of days. There's something is happening two or three times a week for a few weeks in a row. We should definitely be considering doing a CA125 at that point. There are some other more vague symptoms as well where GPs might consider. So change in bowel habit. We've, we've mentioned, I've seen in the chat, some people have been talking about that. So particularly if a woman's never had any bowel problems before, and then, you know, in their 40s, 50s, suddenly they've developed change in their bowels. And that would really, you know, put a red flag in my mind. And um, if they're feeling extremely fatigued and they've lost some weight um, and if they've had some bleeding after the menopause, it might be something that we consider in that circumstance as well. So th those are all times when, when I would expect that your GP would offer you a CA125 blood test and you're well within your rights to say, should we do a CA125 blood test because I'm worried about ovarian cancer and, and see what they say. Great, thank you. And, and, and one of the questions that, that we had um, prior to the session today was around kind of tests giving that reassurance. So um, for example, uh, a, a woman who perhaps has had breast cancer previously, um, moving on to develop ovarian cancer, but hadn't had any tests kind of in that period, one of the things that, that we talk about is whether there's an opportunity for kind of screening um, mm -hmm. and whether the CA125 test is, is reliable for that um, or whether there's anything else that we could be using or any other tests or tools that could help us diagnose ovarian cancer sooner. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we are limited when it comes to ovarian cancer. It's not like other cancers in the UK where we have um, a very reliable uh, screening blood test. Um, we don't unfortunately have that yet for ovarian cancer. Um, what I would say is GPs are only able to request either a CA125 or an ultrasound scan if you've got symptoms, okay? If you've got a particular family history, and like I've said, you've written down that family history, you know exactly what it is, you speak to your GP about it. If you meet the guidelines, and there are specific guidelines nationally that are in place and they're available on the Target website as well, so you can see exactly who should be referred, your GP can refer you on to a genetics clinic and they can decide if screening tests should be done for you. So that's tests that are done when you don't have any symptoms at all. That's tests that are just done on a regular basis. And that might include, for example, an annual CA125, maybe an ultrasound scan, maybe other scans. It really depends on your particular family history and, and what types of cancers that they've had in your family. Thank you. And um, just to follow up on that, because this was another question actually that we had through was around if you do have that kind of family history um, and that you're concerned about and you want to be uh, thinking about kind of genetic testing. Could you just talk us through what genetic tests are available for relatives, perhaps of those who have ovarian cancer? Um, what could they be asking their GP for? Yeah, sure. So um, a GP wouldn't be doing any of the genetic tests, so they would be purely and considering the family history, and if it meets the guidelines to refer on to a genetics clinic, it would then be um, the specialists in the genetics clinic that would make the decisions about what tests need to be done. And that's based on you know talking to the patient and maybe their relatives as well, and looking in their histories and deciding, okay, we think it might be this gene affected or another gene, and they, they might go on and test for that. And um, the most common ones that people have heard of are, are the BRCA, so BRCA1 and 2, um, but again, these aren't tests that GPs can request. It's, it's something that would be requested by a specialist in the genetics clinic if it's appropriate for you. Great, thank you. And um, just coming back onto the CA125 blood test, I think it was something which uh, Catherine referenced in her presentation. But, you know, if, if, if somebody is, is offered a CA125 blood test that comes back with a normal range, could they still have ovarian cancer? What would your advice be in, in that situation? Absolutely. Um, CA125, it's, it's the best test we have available at the moment in the UK. Um, hopefully that might change in the future, but we, we don't have anything that's more specific at the moment for ovarian cancer. Um, and so it absolutely 
could still be ovarian cancer, even if the CA125 is normal. And that's actually what happened in my case. Mine was completely normal, but I had cancer filling my whole pelvis. So um, it obviously shows it doesn't absolutely have to be raised. And indeed, it can be normal at the start. And then six, eight, 12 weeks later, it might be raised. So it, it's not a definitive, you're fine if it is completely normal. Um, Obviously, also, if it's raised, it might not be necessarily ovarian cancer as well. So there's the other side of things. So lots of other things can raise CA125. So if you did get a CA125 test done with your GP and it is raised, we would expect the GP to, to refer on for refer further tests. So normally, would, first step would be an ultrasound scan of the pelvis. But it, it doesn't mean definitively that you've got ovarian cancer if it is raised. It could be raised due to endometriosis or other inflammatory conditions, so inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, those kind of conditions. Um, so coming back to having a normal CA125, um, yes, okay, that's fine as an initial test. What I would say is speak to your GP about it if you've still got symptoms. Um, what you could do is make a symptom diary and just note down, okay, I've had bloating, I've had waterwork symptoms, um, things aren't right when I'm eating and write down how long that's happened for over what period of time and make another GP appointment say you know a couple of weeks later say do we need to repeat the CA125 again in four to six weeks after the original one or do we need to get on and do an ultrasound scan of my pelvis anyway now which thankfully is what my own GP decided to do and that's what led to my diagnosis so um, I think I'm an example of how that can work out for the better. Thank you. And I think it's that really important message, isn't it, that I think has run through um, the presentations today and some of these answers that if you're you're concerned and you've got worries, then, you know, take those to your GP and have that conversation. Um, and just on that note, we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about some of the, the, the challenges today, and we know obviously raising awareness of symptoms so that, that we're all aware of those symptoms and, and prompted to go and seek help with them, but also that it can be quite tricky sometimes to get an appointment with the GP and, and to have that conversation. Um, I wondered, um, and this is to both Charlotte and, and Catherine actually, if you could maybe talk us through, you know, what, what training do GPs currently have around the symptoms of ovarian cancer? Perhaps Charlotte, from your experience as, as a GP trainee, what, what, what have you learned? Um, and Catherine, perhaps you could then talk us through some of the uh, GP training that Target Ovarian Cancer has been doing. Yeah, so from my experience um, in medical school, we study um, ovarian cancer as part and parcel of our gynaecology training. So it's a very small portion of medical school that we would spend on that. Um, and then in GP training, it is, again, something that we cover. Um, but I, I would say that you know, there are so many different conditions to cover and it, it's very hard to know detailed um, information about every single condition in the book. And um, so, of course, you will find GPs that have more knowledge about certain conditions and either might have been personally affected, known someone, had a patient who has been diagnosed. And often when we've learned and reflected from patients, then that sticks in our mind. And that means that sometimes we're better the next time round because we can think about it earlier. Um, but obviously that can't be the same for every single condition. So there will be a wide range of, of experience that you'll, you'll find with, with different GPs, unfortunately. And I think that's, that's the way that it is in general practice for medical conditions. But I think what can help to improve that is really these GP education systems that we're putting in place. Um, so the GPs can learn and they can add that to their continuous professional development, which we have to do every year. We have to reflect on what we've learned every year. And that is a really essential part um, of our job, really, is, is improving and, and learning from our experiences. And um, so I think even if someone might not know super about it, about it now, there's always room for improvement and to learn in the future. And that, I think that's where, as a charity, we can really make a big difference there. Thank you, Charlotte. And, and Catherine, from your perspective, what are some of the ways that, that you found work really well to, to engage in, and train GPs through our work? Um, target ovarian cancer has a very extensive 
GP training program and network, which has been rolling out for a number of years. And I think Charlotte mentioned in her presentation, it was something like 20,000 GPs have been through the training so far. So we're building up quite a strong reputation and track record in being able to do this. But while we move through delivering that, we actually collect um, some champions like Charlotte. We've got several GPs now who do fantastic presentations for us. And of course, it's always very powerful for a GP listening to a GP to hear that story. So quite often when an area approaches us in the very beginning to say, could we help them think about ovarian cancer rates in their area and what they can do to improve diagnosis, quite often we will launch with um, an education program for local primary care, cancer leads, everybody. And in some ways, this is where the pandemic has actually worked in our favour. Because we're doing these virtually, we can record them, we can give the recording to that region. It's They know the people who are talking, who are introducing it, and it gains traction and we get many more people uh, benefiting from the advice that we're giving. We've got a lot of resources, um, both in the forms of webinars but also written resources that we can make available to local regions to use we've got resources that uh, patients you as patients can take into your gp surgery and ask them to put up information around symptoms and, and what can be done and to promote a uh, nurse helpline so in some ways i think at the moment we're broadening out to try and be inclusive of the whole of the primary care clinical and non-clinical workforce to bring everybody um attention to focusing on these symptoms and to treating these symptoms very, very seriously. Um, I'm <laughs> sorry, Helen, I sort of ran out, but that's roughly how it goes. The other thing I think is that the Pennines Lancashire pilot, what was really powerful there was the feeling that it was gonna make a difference. So you take on a project, you test a tool, you feel quite exhausted already because your workload is terribly hard and difficult and people are complaining about primary care and then you have some success and that really focuses the whole team's attention on we can make this happen and I think that's our role as a charity is to really highlight things can be done to make this easier for you and you can save women's lives and everybody wants to be part of that that movement so I think we've gone from education to empowering primary care to bringing new people in and to actually now being able to say, we think we can help you do this um, and we can help you do it very easily and it won't cost very much. And that's a very powerful message. That's great, Catherine. Thank you so much. I'm very conscious of time. I know that we could carry on discussing it this for, for, for much longer, but we are coming to the end of our time today. And I will, in, in the wrap up, just talk about some of our, our next steps. So I know we've got some questions around next steps for the project that, that Catherine's been describing. Um, but just before we do that, and very, very quickly, if we can, I just want to invite uh, Charlotte and Catherine as our panellists, just to, to kind of sum up in kind of one or two sentences, what would you really hope that people will take away from today's session? So I'll start with you, Charlotte. Yeah, I think the main thing is um, any symptoms you've got, keep a track of them, write down what you're worried about, and then make a GP appointment stating that you are concerned about ovarian cancer specifically and talk through the symptoms that you've got. And I would say if you do get an initial normal CA125 level, don't let that deter you from going back again and speaking again about your symptoms if you're still concerned. Um, and again, about the family history side of things. Um, if you do have a particular family history, write down the details make a GP appointment so that you can speak to them about having further genetic tests or screening if that's what you would like to have done. Thank you. And and Catherine, what, what would you like to leave us with today? I think, uh, obviously, I'm in a quite unique space because I'm coming to the end of a project which I believe has proved <laughs> that it doesn't need to be the way it is. So I'm very focused on that at the moment and how we deliver that um, as a charity. And the reason why we deliver it is because it's so important and the way we deliver it is by doing it all together so i think my closing comment is it doesn't have to be as bad as it has been it can be easier and it can be a win-win for patients and for clinicians and everybody involved in the diagnostic pathway yeah that's an incredibly positive note to finish on today catherine and and you know just a huge thank you charlotte and catherine for, for presenting to us today and, and taking our questions I'm so sorry if we weren't able to get to your specific question today. Um, as always with these sessions, the time just goes so, so quickly, but hopefully we've been able to, to, to kind of give across 
um, some answers to, to some of those key queries that you had. Um, if there are any questions that you're left with or any concerns that you would like to have a chat about, again, please do call our support line. Um, I know that they would love to hear from you. So um, the details are in the chat um, and on our website. So, so please do check that out. And um, just to a couple of the, the points around next steps on this project, well, you know, I think we had a question around, are we talking to NHS England? Are we going to be inviting people to take part? Absolutely. You know, as Catherine's talked about, this is an area where we really want to work with teams across the UK to help us kind of make things get better. Um, and we've launched our early diagnosis network, which is specifically for clinical teams. Um, so that would be for GPs, uh, for people in primary care systems, for people who work in the health service who want to make those improvements. Um, but absolutely for everybody, you know, we would love to get um, as many people involved in this work as possible. Um, so you can either encourage your kind of uh, local healthcare professional teams to get involved in our network, um, but also check out our campaigners network as well, because that's an area where lots of our campaigners, I recognize lots of names on the call today, um, you know, really support us to take action around awareness raising, um, support for GPs and really getting um, early diagnosis up the political agenda as well, because a lot of the challenges we've talked about today, we're constantly knocking on the door um, of the government and the Department of Health and the NHS to really make those changes we want to see. Um, thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. We are running a little bit over time, um, but I wanted to, to again thank our panellists for sharing their experiences and expertise. Um, so just in closing, on behalf of the Target of Varian Cancer team, thank you again so much for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.